for coming. I think this is really exciting. We're having a very uh, well-attended Media Democracy Day this year, which certainly indicates some appetite for some changes in, uh, in the media representation, but also the way and the production of how media is created. This panel is specifically about gender, sexuality, and violence, and we're looking at media representations, but we're also doing um, especially our, my esteemed colleagues here have been doing work in media production as well. So the one thing I want to say um, to begin with is just to give a little five minute clip on some of the uh, talk of uh, some of the work that I've done uh, around just the visibility of women in the news. That's the area that I do my work in. Just to kind of give a context around that and then we also have another, a number of issues around the framing of women's representation, the framing of what's often referred to as alternative sexualities, but is really gay, lesbian, queer, etc., and the representations to some extent around um, uh, how gender and sexuality is often associated with violence or particular forms of, uh, of media. Um, I think I need my usher there. Thank you very much. So the first thing I want to just say very quickly is I've been involved for uh, a few years now with a project called the Global Media Monitoring Project, which is this, which is started in 1995. It was a project that began under the auspices of the UN. It, there was a, a, a very large meeting in Beijing which talked about the um, how to create more equality for women in the world. And one of the subsections was uh, section J, which talked about the importance of women in the media, both as media producers and as representation. So since then, we do a analysis of media in uh, almost, well, this last one was 108 countries, representing 85% of, of the population in the world. And this is our fourth one. We do it every five years. And, uh, and so it's a quantitative and qualitative analysis of women showing up in the news, well, gender in the news, both in terms of how many are representative subjects as well as how, um, how many are journalists. So if you could just, I just want to show you our basic finding. This is 108 countries. Generally, women are represented 24% of the time, which considering that women make up just over half of the population of the world, it's a strikingly inaccurate portrayal of what the world is. And that some of the language that has been used in the reports, um, I just want to say there's a press release over there, if you, which has the website to get all the reports from every country, every region, and the global report as well. It's a strikingly inaccurate portrayal. In Canada, it's slightly better. It's 30%. If you could do the next one. Uh, the overall is at the end there, and that's the Canadian results, which is about 30%. Still 70% 70, 70%, uh, subjects in the news are male. Sorry, are female. And the subject is both someone who has been quoted or someone about whom the story was about. So men were two and a half times more likely to be news subjects, three times more likely to be found in stories about politics and government, which makes up that and crime make up the bulk of the news. And there was some invisibility across all news platforms. This was um, print, radio, and television, although interestingly, radio was, uh, was the worst. And finally, I just want to show you that the results over the years have not been particularly good for North America. I also wrote the North American report for this. Uh, while globally it has increased uh, from 17% to 24% over 15 years, which uh, we worked out at that rate, we would reach parity or ad adequate representation in 40 years, which is kind of a bit long. Uh, within North America, those numbers are sort of plateauing that there has really not been significant increase, and that begs the question why that is. Is it, on one level, we have this idea that the West is pre uh, predominantly post-feminist, and that these are not particularly important issues for us, and yet we seem to be kind of stalling between the 27, 28% over 15 years. Perhaps that's the glass ceiling of visibility in news, we don't know. 
Uh, I just want to. I just wanted to give you. I'm not. You're really not here to hear me. You're here to to hear the um, our guests here. I just wanted to give you just a bit of context for some of this. Uh, I want to um, now introduce the panel. We have um, we have uh, Jen Sung, who is replacing Andrew, <coughs> who could not uh, unfortunately could not make it. And Jen is involved in Add On Screen, which is a, uh, a queer film development corporation and doing support around sexuality visibility in the community. And I love how uh, Gwen says that she is uh, a proud proudly owned by her five cats. <laughs> Um, but she's also finished a, a degree in, uh, at UBC's Women and Gender Study programs in 2009. So thank you for being here, Jen. We have Marcia Newberry next to her, who is the, man the managing director for a fantastic conference that happened a couple weeks ago in Vancouver called Sex Money Media. This was a conference that was sponsored by Women in View, an organization, it's a national collaboration of women working in the Canadian media industry. Uh, Marcia is also currently pursuing her PhD at, uh, in our department at, at SFU, where her scholarship looks at gender and production practices and policy, and women as content creators. Also importantly, Marcia is an accomplished film producer uh, with numerous documentary awards herself. Welcome her. And finally, on the panel, we have Dr. Mary Lynn Young, who is the uh, director of the UBC Graduate School of Journalism. She's associate professor, award-winning academic, and university educator. She joined the faculty of Graduate School of Journalism in uh, 2000, and uh, I have to say that we have seen significant differences and fantastic work coming out of there since 2000 in particular, so I'm sure a lot of it is thanks to the work that uh, Mary Lynn has been doing. And, uh, and so we're going to go in the order of Marsha, and then Jen, and then, um, and then Mary Lynn Young, and then we will open it up for questions afterwards. with a couple of uh, confessions. Um, the first confession is that this is my first Media Democracy Day, but uh, despite being a documentary filmmaker, I've just never come, but I'm actually really thrilled to be here. Uh, today I'm going to mostly uh, re-present some information that was presented at our conference, Sex Money Media, which was presented by the Gina Davis Institute for Gender and Media. Uh, but before I go there, I actually wanted to share an anecdote with you, which involves, uh, inside of this anecdote, are a couple of other confessions. Uh, the first being that I'm actually quite new to the whole issue of gender and sexism and women in media. While for the past 10 years I've been a woman in media and a woman producer, I thought that everything was fine. I thought that sexism was just a personal thing. As a woman professional, you encounter barriers and obstacles all the time, but that you had to develop a personal style to get past it. And even though I grew up in offices, probably the first 15 years of my working life were in offices that were basically like madmen, except without the great clothes and the good looking people. Uh, <laughs> I thought that we had solved it. I bought that message that we had solved everything. Until I had an experience in 2008 I was producing a two-hour dramatic movie for CTV, big budget drama, it was a really big deal, we were all very excited. And we had been developing it for about five years, and we had talked a lot about women as a demographic. Uh, we had a woman writer, and we thought, you know, we're going to hit the right tone, and what does <coughs> we want, and what do we want to say. 
never thought at all about women behind the scenes at all. It didn't even occur to us until two weeks before principal photography. We got a call from our broadcaster saying, what have you done to make sure that there are a lot of women working on this show? And we all gathered very quickly, the four producers, three, three men and myself, gathered into a small office and quickly went into panic mode because we realized we hadn't thought about it at all. And the broadcaster was absolutely right. And we quickly went through all of our crew. Oh my God, oh my God. You know, our first reaction was, to be honest, WTF, like <laughs> two weeks before principal photography. Why are you asking us this now? But we realized we hadn't done enough at all. And the only thing that we could do, it was decided at this meeting, was that I would call the broadcaster and explain that we had done everything possible and that I was enough. That they didn't need to worry about hiring women or representing women because I was going to carry the entire burden <laughs> of the show and representing uh, women. And it was, we're good, we're good. And so, of course, I made that call, but it's, uh, I think it's fair to say it, it brought me alive to the issue and it really made me start to think about these things. And it was just a few months later that I started my degree at SFU. And really, of course, began to think about these things. So when I was approached to join Women in View, I went, oh, yeah, this is a problem. People aren't aware of this. Producers, me, I was not aware of it, and there is more that can be done. So Women in View, uh, as Kathleen mentioned, is a coalition of women from across uh, Canada who were alarmed by some studies, some done here in BC by the BC Institute of Film Professionals, also in Quebec by hopefully I'm saying it right, and I think from Atlanta, Canada as well, that showed that women across the board were underrepresented behind the scenes. That, you know, for instance, at the Directors Guild of Canada, I think the latest estimates we have, it's an estimate because they don't count women or men as members, but we think it's around 10%. Uh, and I see the camera union, it's around 3% of women are cinematographers, but if you look at makeup or wardrobe, it's about 95%. So some real stereotypical things going on there. And of course we were really alarmed by the hypersexualization of uh, women and men in media today. So we decided, uh, Rena Fraticelli, who's the executive director and um, our partners at SFU decided that we couldn't let this ball drop and we were going to have a conference and that was Sex Money Media. And we brought together scholars and film professionals and broadcasters and government policy makers and women in technology and as big a cross section with video game makers there uh, to talk about this issue and share research. And so I wanted to share with you kind of the main research that came down at the conference around representation. And it was presented by Madeline Denono, who is executive director of the Gina Davis Foundation and Dr. Stacy Smith, who is a researcher at the University of Southern California's Annenberg School of Communications. If you haven't heard of the Gina Davis Foundation, I'm, or Institute, I'm gonna assume you've heard of Gina Davis, but she started an institute because she was really concerned about representations in children's programming, and she was raising her daughters to realize that uh, what they were watching was really skewed. So her institute really works with studios, and production companies to educate them about the stereotyping that happens on, in children's programming and in family films, feature films. Um, they have done the largest research project ever undertaken on gender in children's entertainment. Um, they've done three, four discrete studies, one on children's television and three on film, and then they released the latest results at our uh, conference. So their recent study called Gender Disparity on Screen and Behind the Camera in Family Films. They looked at 122 top grossing domestic family films rated G, PG, and PG-13 between the dates of September 2006 to September 7, 2009. In total, they looked at 5,554 speaking, speaking characters. They found that Gender was very imbalanced. This is a statistic we see sort of across the board. Uh, 
71% male, 29% female, translating into 2.42 males to every one female. This also represents no statistical change in over 20 years. They've been gathering these statistics since, um, based on films from 1990, and there's, I think there's been like a 1 or 2% change in this ratio since then. They also found that gender affects the hypersexuality of characters in film. Uh, female characters were far more likely to be shown as um, what they call eye candy. A higher percentage of females and males were depicted in sexually revealing clothing. That's what the SRC there is, sexually revealing clothing. Uh, they were shown as more physically attractive and with an unrealistic body shape. That's the small waist you see there, which they call in their reports, no room for a womb. <laughs> and also partial nudity. So there's a big difference between the way men and women are represented in these. Remember, this is family films that we're talking about. They also broke this down by age. Uh, and as you can see that, especially in the youngest category, you're more likely to see females portrayed as, as much younger than you are to see the male uh, characters, reinforcing the idea that youthfulness, beauty, and a sexy uh, presentation are more important for females than for males. They wanted to know as well if there was a link between women working behind the scenes or no women working behind the scenes and what was happening on screen. So in these 122 films they counted the number of women working as directors, writers, or producers. And they found that only 7% of the women were direct, 7% of the films had women directors, 13% had writers, and 20% had producers. So it actually gets quite, it's worse. And these numbers really match what we see from Dr. Martha Lozen's uh, celluloid seasoning report, and it also matches the studies that we've done here in BC as well, and across Canada, that we see this kind of ratio behind the scenes. And they found that perhaps there is a relationship between if you have women behind the scenes and women on screen. Their results showed an almost 10% increase in women characters on productions where there was at least one woman as a writer, and an almost 8% increase where there was a woman director. I'm sorry, I should have put numbers on here. Uh, for the directors, they found that where there was no women, it was 28.8%, but 35.1%. If there was a female director, and it's 26% for writers, and 36.4% if there is a woman that goes up. That's really their results. I threw this picture in because I've been thinking about this picture for about the last two weeks. I went out and bought GQ because I heard uh, Dr. Rebecca Sullivan from the University of Calgary give a great uh, piece on CBC Radio about this uh, spread in GQ. I don't know if anyone's seen it, but this is Glee. Well, I'm not going to say, I have a lot I could possibly say about this, but I really just wanted to throw this up there because she asked what I thought was a really great question. Um, that it's about what sort of culture we want, what sort of society do we want. And this for me is a reminder that as much as I believe in fighting for women behind the camera, that just having more women behind the camera and just counting the women on screen isn't enough. That it's the type of images that are out there as well that's important. That's all I have.